we'll see that that this week we've kind of swayed a little bit, well, a lot from our um, going through the uh, the Gospel of John. Um, sometimes God prods and provokes and. You read things or things go on in your own mind and heart. It's kind of, it's like a, a dust cloud that's stirred up and it just keeps stirring up and it's not settling. And these things are on your mind and thoughts and stirrings. And it's like sometimes it's even like having a bit of a jab in the ribs. It's like God won't let you go with certain things. And some things have been on my mind recently. With, this is why I've. Uh, kind of brought out Ephesians 3. The, these particular words in verses 20 and 21 have been on my mind for a while now. And every now and again they keep kind of rearing in their head and, and kind of prodding me and causing me to think and causing me to ask questions of myself first and foremost. And then also to you and then to the wider church community in this generation. So here we've got this prayer of Paul, who prays mightily. And you know, I, I ordered a book, at least I, I, I enemy got it me for Christmas. The Charles Spurgeon book it is. And it's all to do with the prayers of the Apostle Paul. And I'm looking forward to kind of trying to delve into that. Because I believe that these are going to be very helpful. I want you to notice what he prays. And then... I mean, this isn't actually the kind of emphasis of the message, but think about what he prays. And think about how different it is to how we pray a lot of the time. But he says things like, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height. And he says this, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. This is not something that you can fully grasp. It's beyond, his love for us is beyond what we can know. That to me is something Hard to grapple with. How can you grapple with something that's above my knowledge? I can only trust in the Lord to reveal these things progressively to me. But to know the love of Christ which passes or surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness of God. This is prayer extraordinaire. This is, this is, this is extravagant. That we might be filled with the fullness of God. I often ask myself, you know, am I filled with the fullness of God? Do I really know what that means? But then these verses come in. It says this. After this prayer, it says, Now, now to him who is able to exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, he is able to do exceedingly, Abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. To him be glory by the church, in the church by Christ Jesus, to all generations, forever and ever. And I, I've been thinking about this, and it's been prodding in my mind, and I'm asking this, these questions of myself, thinking about God who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we ask or think. Above it all. And I think to myself, well, what do we ask? What do we expect? This is why I've titled this Great Expectations, but I put two question marks on the end. Great Expectations, question mark. And I think that we've got, we've developed this way of living. Or I am thinking about myself. What are my expectations of God, really? Have I just started to live life every day, normally? Just one day is the same as the next, and I don't really expect any more. What do I expect of God? What do you expect of God, is the question. 
He expects this prayer that he prays to be answered. He expects, to, he believes fully that God will do this in the Ephesians that he's praying for. That they will know the fullness of God. That they will be able to, to feel, to grasp, to, uh, to experience this, this love of Christ. This, this height, this width, this length, this depth. He's praying for them. And what I'm trying to get to in the sense early on is he's praying and he believes that God will do what he prays. And I wonder sometimes how we view God. Do we actually expect God to do what we pray? Now, friends, I know that within you, you might just suddenly turn around to me without a moment's thought and go, oh, oh yes, of course we do, of course we do. But listen, think more deeply. Do you really believe that he will do what you pray? Because I believe that at times we have these kind of things that just roll off, roll off the tongue, roll off the mind. In, 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 in the Christian life, we can, we, can, we can just live one day to the next and everything becomes normal. Everything becomes monotone. Everything becomes usual. And we kind of live this life that we... <clears throat> I don't know, we don't kind of seem to expect more of God. In our prayers, in our daily business, in, in the church, in, in what we're praying for our families, in, in, in things that go way beyond us. I believe, you see, what, what Phil brought out about this, this, this father. I'm going to use the scripture, but I'm referring to the one in Matthew rather than Mark. What does he talk about? He talks about unbelief, doesn't he? Unbelief. And I'm going to say this, I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm going to say this, there is a ton of unbelief in the church. Amongst people who profess Christ Jesus. I'm not saying they don't believe in Jesus. I'm not saying that they're not Christians. But I'm saying that there's a whole load of unbelief. We, it's almost like we've forgotten how to believe that God is God. Who is it that we're praying to? Is it just some, some God that's just sat up there and he says, Oh, they're praying again, goodness me. So here I am, I've got my feet up and here they are praying again. And I'll, just, I, you know, I'll just put it on the, on the back burner for later. You know, is that the kind of God we pray to? Let me just read to you a few verses from Matthew 17. Matthew 17, 14 through 20. Fourteen then says, And when they had come to the multitude, this is Jesus and those who were with him coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration. When they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, speaking of Jesus, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic. And suffers severely. For he often falls into the fire. And often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples. But they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said. O oh, faithless and perverse generation. How long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. And listen to this. Verse 19. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief. For assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. These are the men that spent three and a half years with the Messiah. Who saw him day by day, doing things, speaking in authority, 
unlike the scribes. Casting out demons, healing the sick, raising the dead. And they said, why couldn't we do it? Remember previously, he'd already given them authority to go out and do this. And there are other things to look into when we talk about this particular uh, incident, when he talks later on about prayer and fasting. It's not the, the point of focus for today, but it's important things there. But he's, they say, what, why could we not do it? And what does he say? What does he say to these men that spent time with him? What does he say to these people who believed in him, who had probably already confessed a number of times that they believed he was the Christ, the Messiah? We're not talking to inexperienced people here. But he says this, because of your unbelief. He says it to them, because of your unbelief. Who is it that he is addressing when he says, Oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? Who is he talking to? He's not talking to the crowd. He's not even talking to the Father. He's not talking to the Son. The Father there is, is Phil read out. He says, I believe, but help my unbelief. Jesus here is speaking to his disciples. He is saying to them, oh perverse and faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? He says to them, because of your unbelief. That's what he said to them. Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief. That's why he didn't see it. And I just, I just wonder, really, what do we believe? Do we, do we believe in the power of God today in our generation? Do we really believe it? You know, we've got, a, we've got a town here, and all these places that you represent, of people walking by day by day, oblivious to the fact that they're on the way to hell. And we read about revival, and we get excited when we read it, excited. Sometimes I close the book and I suddenly feel like I'm transported back into real everyday life. And I just wish I could be there, reading about how God has revived the land. What I'm saying is this, is this the same God here that we read of in Matthew today? Is this the same Jesus Christ we serve? Is it the same God who cast stars into space? I was reading Genesis earlier this, this week. I started to read Genesis again and I realised, I've read it I don't know how many times. But he created the earth before he created the stars. I'm thinking we've got this small little planet here that's smaller than Mercury, smaller than these other ones, smaller than Jupiter and Saturn and all that. But it says that he created the light to rule the day and the light to rule the night after the earth. And I find that really interesting. I mean, you kind of think that we're just one little planet in the midst of all this solar system. But actually, he made the earth before that. Before he put the stars there. And this is the God that we serve. But then I wonder, on a day-to-day -day basis, do we really think about that? Do we really believe that we serve the same God that we read from the very first page right to the end of this book? Because you can't look into this book and see anything normal. God is so powerful. There are so many examples he casts, like I said, the stars into space. He hangs the sun where it is and the moon where it is. This is by the power, and it's upheld by the power of Jesus Christ. It says that he, up, he upholds the world. But we seem to have so much unbelief. Jesus, again, in Matthew 13... Verses 57 and 58 says this, Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honour except in his own country and in his own house. And he says this, Now he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Think of ourselves as being a house. Think of this being a house. And we think, he did not do many mighty works there because of his unbelief. Is that possible? 
Is it very possible that there are not many mighty works done because of our unbelief? These are the questions we need to ask ourselves when we read such scriptures as this. It's not just to be read of, because we read about Jesus' life and oh, what a great life he lived and how he did so many wonderful things then. What about now? Is it the same Jesus that we serve who did these things? Do we have great expectations of God? That's the question. Do we live like do we live like we believe that? And I think that one evidence to suggest whether we do or we don't is in how we pray, what we pray. Do we just go to God with a little shopping basket? Lord, you know, I'm feeling too well again. Just really need your help right now. Listen, I'm not saying that's a wrong prayer. Don't don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is they're more than that. Look what Paul prayed here. He's praying, he's, he's, he's praying for a whole church. In, in fact, he says, let's have a look. The saints who are in Ephesus is suggested. That means that says to me that this is possibly to even more than one church in Ephesus. But it's to the saints in Ephesus. And he prays this. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he goes on to say that he would grant you according to where are we? according to the riches of his glory verse 16 to be strengthened with might through his spirit what a prayer to pray he doesn't mention anything about people's needs at this point he doesn't mention anything about the perhaps that there are sick folk among them and like I've said don't take it the wrong way. I'm not saying here we shouldn't pray for the sick. The Bible tells us we should. We should be having them prayed for constantly. Those that can and want to should be anointed with oil by the hands of the elders. We should do all that. And we do, we have. But my point is that there's, there's more than that. And he is here praying that God would work in your lives and your souls. That you would be strengthened with might in the inner man. You'd be empowered by him to live. That he might dwell in your hearts through faith and you will be rooted and grounded in love. That you might be able to comprehend with all the saints <coughs> the width, the length, the depth, the height and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. To be filled with all the fullness of God. Now that, that is a prayer. That is a prayer. What do we expect of God? Do we expect that God can save your family? Well, again, you might say yes, or so I wouldn't pray it. <coughs> but then time goes along, doesn't it? Nothing seems to happen. This and that and the other, and life goes on, and you just wonder if times if you just repeat in this prayer. I want to read you something. Very shortly, a short piece of writing regarding a man called George Muller. Muller, Muller, I'm not sure how you pronounce it. I'm sure you've heard of him. He was a man that uh, did great deeds in building orphanages for children. He was one of the co-founders of the Plymouth, Plymouth Brethren before they split. Just let me read this quote. It says, the children, this is talking about the children in an orphanage. Let's listen to what happened here. The children are dressed and ready for school, but there is no food for them to eat. The housemaker of the orphanage informed George Mueller. George asked her to take 300 children into the dining room and have them sit at the tables. He thanked God for the food and waited. George knew God would provide food for the children, as he always did. Within minutes, a baker knocked on the door. Mr. Mueller, he said, last night I could not sleep. Somehow I knew that you would need bread this morning. I got up and baked three batches for you. I will bring it in. Soon there was another knock at the door. It was the milkman. His cart had broken down in front of the orphanage. The milk would spoil by the time the will was fixed, 
So he asked George if he could make use of some free milk. George smiled as the milkman brought in ten large cans of milk. It was just enough for the 300 thirsty children. And then this man who built these orphanages, he, he, he prayed, obviously, he sought the Lord, he knew that God had called him to do this, but he said, I am not going to lay one brick until I've got at least half of the amount of money to pay for it. So he did that. And he expected and believed the Lord would provide the rest. Now what would we do? Would we look in the bank and think, oh, well, we've not really got enough of that. Would we make a plan and think, no, that's just too big for us? This man believed God. He sat the kids down and he prayed and he believed that one way or the other, that the God that he believed in, the God of the Bible, the God of heaven and earth, would not leave these children to starve. Now, I wonder if that were me, what would I do? I'd probably think, well, who can I borrow some money off? I wonder if Aldi will be able to just kind of put me on some credit or... You know what I mean? We, we have this way of going on that it's almost like we have to fix our own problem. We pray about it and then we go and do our own thing. This man believed in God. He believed and he came through. There are other things that happened with this man. But there's just two examples. That this, this, this verse says, Now to him who is able... To do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think. And it keeps prodding in my mind and my heart. Do I, do I believe this? Is he really able to do it? Is he really able to work in this town? Is he really able to fill every seat in this church? Or are we going to sit and worry about the dwindling, dwindling numbers? Is he able to finance this church? Or are we going to worry about how much people are tithing? Now we need to obey God. We need to obey the fact that God tells us to give. And I know that you have and I know that you do. That's not the point I'm making. I'm just making a point about what we do. Do we rely upon men or do we rely upon God? That's my, that's my question. And I think at times, at least, I'm coming from my own mind and heart and perhaps yours. That many times... I perhaps rely on myself and my own ability and my strength and my finances and what I have or what I don't have in order to do things. Can this church reach this town? Can this church reach the city of Doncaster? Um, you know, most of us are older now and can't really get out there and do what we probably once would. Barrier after barrier the barrier. And that's, that's the way we come to think. It's not about just turning your back on things and, and not dealing with reality. Nobody would expect an older generation to be out on the streets. Nobody would expect those that are dealing with sickness to be getting freezing cold out on the street. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just making examples of the point that what is it that stops us? Is it our unbelief? Because we're just a group of people with very limited resources and very limited people to do stuff. God is able. Now, A.W. Tozer, which I believe you're a fan of, aren't you, Phil? You like A.W. Tozer? Aidan uh, Wilson Tozer, was it? He said this, and this is a quote I read years ago and it's never left me. He said this, God is looking for those with whom he can do the impossible. What a pity that we plan only the things we can do by ourselves. I'm going to read that again. Listen carefully. God is looking for those with whom he can do the impossible. What a pity we plan only the things we can do by ourselves. Are we guilty of that? Do we only plan things, think about things that we can do, or do we go beyond the pale and believe that God is the God of the impossible? Did he not say, with men is impossible? I'm going to read that in a second. With God, all things are possible. God is looking. And he might be looking at us this morning. What a pity we plan only the things we can do by ourselves. 
Mark 5, 35 to 36. While he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, your daughter is dead. This is, of course, speaking to Jairus, whose daughter was ill, and went, he went to him, and he said he would come, and then the, the lady came with the issue of blood and took the power out of him and kind of took the journey back a little bit, and then by the time they were ready to go, one of his servants came and said, don't trouble the teacher any longer. Why trouble the teacher any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word was, that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not be afraid, only believe. Do we live that way? Only believe. Or do we just live this... I don't even know what to term it. This Christianity that just says, well, we'll do our daily reading. Maybe if we get time, we'll just have a little prayer. We'll just get on with the normal life that we live. And then perhaps we'll do the same tomorrow. Perhaps we'll go to a meeting here and there. I, I just look sometimes and I think, is there not more than that? Is there not more? Do we not expect more of God than just going on day to day with the normality? Because he says here, only believe. That's what he commands us to do. Again, Matthew 19, 23 to 26. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Assuredly, I say to you that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said to them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. You see, it might be easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for this single sol uh, church on its own to affect and to see what wonderful works in the whole of Doncaster. might be easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for this church to be the centre of revival. And he said that for a rich man. Easy for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. But he said this, with men, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. You not know, sometimes think when you're praying that you're just kind of reeling off stuff that you think you ought to pray. I, I'm, I'm being honest. It happens. Do you do that? You write a few things down. Again, this is not about the subject of right or wrong. This is about we're dealing with ourselves, our hearts, our belief, our trust, our expectation. Do I expect God to move in my family? Phil was praying for his mum for so many years. And then she starts to come back again. And you think, wow, God answers prayer. He does answer prayer. He does. What about the next thing? What about the drug dealers in this very place? Can God take one of them and put them at the very head of the church? In a sense, speaking, like he did Paul. We read about Paul, we look at him, we think, whoa, what a fantastic story. But then we get into our life. And I just wonder, again, do I, do I really believe that God can do that for this person? Oh, Lord, help my unbelief, is the cry. Do I expect him to do it? What about David against Goliath, the young shepherd boy? People say he must have been around about the age of 15, or maybe there, or in between, a bit more, a bit less, I don't know. But he was a young boy. And he comes into the army of of. Israel, his older brothers there, Eliab, Saul, who is head and shoulders above the rest, the tall, strong king, is 
quivering and shivering, wrecking his tent because of Goliath. And here's the shepherd boy comes and he's looking and he's saying, why is nobody doing anything about this guy? This uncircumcised Philistine who comes against the armies of the living God. Well, if you're not going to do it, I'm going to go. Well, you're just a boy. This man's a warrior. He's been a warrior all his life. And what have you been doing apart from looking after your father's sheep? Oh, you're going to have to wear my armour, son. Except his torso probably buried the whole of him. It's too big, too heavy, too clunky. He said, no, I'm not having any of them. I'll just take you sling and a few stones. I mean, faith. He goes right out into the very centre, knowing that this man has killed many people, many warriors before him. And he goes right out into the centre. And he actually promises before he goes that he will kill him. Why, because he's strong? Because he's a warrior? No, because he trusts in his God. Because he knows that this man is coming against the God of heaven and earth. Against the God of Israel. And so he goes out and he does what he says because he expects God to go before him. Jonathan and his armour bearer is the same. They're hiding behind the rocks. They don't know how many of the Philistines are, are before them. He says, shall we go? Shall we go up and take our swords and and his arm bearer says, I'm going with you no matter what happens. I'm with you. And they jump up at the out, out of the rocks, out of the hole there in. Fight them. I don't know how many they were. Maybe 20 or 30 or so. And they didn't know that. They didn't know how many they were. But they went and they did. And they trusted that God would be before them. You've got to look at these people. One well, educated commoners from Galilee. It says in Acts 17, verse 6, they were unschooled men. They didn't go through the schools of the synagogues, of the, pre, of the, of the Pharisees. They were uneducated, and Galileans were, were, were commoners. And it said that these men turned the world upside down. Again, why should we not turn the world upside down? Why not? It's the same God, isn't it? The faith of Abraham. He believed the impossible. The impossible probability of having a child at 100 years old. And his wife was 90. Nobody in this room is 100 years old. I'm not sure anybody's 90. Maybe nearly. But not quite. And yet Sarah believed God. And Abraham believed God. Even when the mathematical problem didn't work out. They believed God. And that's the kind of faith that pleases God. Moses at the Red Sea. He's just taken all the Israelites with him. He's trusted in God. And God has said what he was going to do and did it. He took them out of Egypt. And what happens? They find themselves directed by God, by the way. There's a Red Sea before them, Egypt behind them. Nowhere else to turn. He had to trust in God or fail. That's the only choices he had. And God commanded him to hold up his staff, touch the water, whatever it is he did. And as we know, the Red Sea parted. Something miraculous that even he would have not expected. And they walked through, not in mud, and not losing the shoes in the mud, but on dry land. But he was there, faced with it. That's the, oh, God has brought us here, and that's the only way forward through the sea. How are we going to do that? If we go back, we're dead. <laughs> I'm not sure about you, uh, you but uh, I wouldn't like to be in that position. Certain death or possible drowning. And God opened up the sea. Hebrews 11 is a chapter, isn't it, full of the, the, the great hall of, fa of, of faith. Every person mentions, it says, by faith. By faith. Moses by faith. Abraham by faith. David by faith, whoever it was he mentioned, it's by faith, by faith, by faith. And then look at what Daniel says. 
He says, those who do wickedly against the covenant, he shall corrupt with flattery. Daniel 11.32. And he says this, but the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. Shall. So then, do we know our God? Are we strong? Do we believe in God for great exploits today in this generation? Where Christianity, in my opinion, has just sank into a pit. I'm talking generally. I'm not talking about every individual church. I'm talking about generally. You've got people jumping around in skinny ripped jeans, preaching messages that aren't even really from the Bible. And they they think having a good time and dancing around and feel good is the power of God. That's not the power of God actually here. There's not the power of God to change a village or, or a town or a city or a nation. Is that the exploits that God's talking about? I don't think so. I think, I think that God is still in the business of working powerful miracles. I think God is still in the business of bringing people to their knees in sin and the knowledge of it. I think God is still in the business of revival. I don't think we pray about it enough. I don't think we pray about it. Why? Do we believe really that he can do what he did in the Isle of Lewis right here? Now, I'm not saying he will just because we're praying it. Don't get me wrong. That's his... People who think they can stir up revival, they're wrong. People who call meetings revival meetings, they're wrong. Only God is the God of revival. Only God awakens a town or a city. Not my passionate preaching is going to do anything. It's him and his power and his decision and his will. But nevertheless, should we not pray for it? Should we not expect it? Should we not hope for it? Should we not hope that this town can be changed? Surely. We're not just living to go to church on a weekly basis and that's it and go to heaven at the end of it all. A friend of mine before, just before I came here, he... uh, I kind of had two services in a way. I had one to leave Jacksdale, and then one when I came here. Now, this friend of mine, he came to the induction with his wife, but he couldn't make the one I left at Jacksdale, going back to America to see family. He had to sort out those, those things. But he sent me a voice message um, because he couldn't make it. Now, I've condensed this and just to a few points of what he said to me, but he, he sent me a message that was about 23 minutes long. But he said to me, he encouraged me in being inducted as pastor. He said this, constantly remember what sort of God you have. As you leave the church, constantly remember what sort of God you have. He said, lead the church intentionally down paths that demand more than human resources has to offer. Take the church down paths that demand that you trust God or you fail. Don't give in to unbelief. Put God to the test, which he referenced Malachi. Attempt the impossible. We have a God who can do the impossible. That is why we should attempt the impossible. If we've got a God, the Bible says... All things are possible with God. If we believe that, then why don't we attempt the impossible? That doesn't make sense. And he says, do it, attempt it, attempt the impossible. He says, don't be too quick to say, oh, we can't do that. Don't be guided. He said this, don't be guided by the pound. Don't be guided by what is in the bank account. How often? How often are we? We just don't have the resources for it. Well, how about praying to God to give them to you? How about actually planning to go and do whatever it is that you believe God's calling you to do and trust that he'll provide for it? Rather than checking the bank account and saying we can or can't. That's, these are the kind of things he's saying. Don't ever be too quick to say we can't do that when it comes to things that seem like they are too big or too outrageous, or too much, or too far, or too expensive, or overall too impossible. Don't be too quick to say we can't. 
Put your trust in God Almighty. Put your hope in him and attempt to do things that require you to rest on the Lord or fail. Think big. Pray big. Why? Because your God is big. Attempt great things for God and watch what he will do. This is the advice he gave me. And I listened to it again not so long back because of all this was stirring in within me. I thought, yeah. And I want to say this, this is not just advice for some guy who, who, who is you know, just trying to give me a nice message. This is a guy that lives what he speaks. This is a guy whose church has revolutionised. Who grew massively. Who, who, who built a um, refuge, refuge house for battered women. When they had no money. He preached the vision. And he preached it to the people. And they, they, they took up an offering, a free will offering. And I think... He expected. He said. He said he expected about sixteen thousand dollars to come in, and he said over sixty thousand dollars came in, and then this happened, and then that happened, and then more money came. Then somebody, um, there was a note that came from the post office, their version of the post office anyway, and he went and somebody had posted in a fifty thousand dollar check. You know, these are the kind of things that I mean. God is looking for people through whom He can do the impossible. What a pity we plan only the things we can do by ourselves. Do we believe that God can do more here? Do you believe that God can do more through you? Or do you just want to live your normal Christian life? Now, I don't want to say that like if all of us don't kind of walk in some kind of miracle or something that we're just not living the proper Christian life. I do not want to say that at all. I'm just talking about what we expect of God. I'm not saying that we're ever going to achieve what George Mueller achieved. I'm not saying we're ever going to achieve what George Whitfield did or, or Charles Wesley. Uh, John Wesley, Charles Wesley or Charles Spurgeon or all these people or even this friend of mine. I'm not saying that we won't necessarily go through life and that we might not be one of those that are just called to, to walk in something that's just you know, absolutely impossible. But I'm talking about, should we not expect it? Should we not pray? Should we not believe? Should we not, should we not be on our knees, grasping over the hem of his garment, or, the, or his metaphorical ankles, if you like, and pleading with the Lord to do something? But instead, we find ourselves so dry. Prayer meeting, so, so empty. Where is our desire? Where is our belief? Where is our trust? Where is our faith? Where is our expectation? Of this great and mighty God that we serve. We read the scriptures. I know, I know that you guys know the Bible. You read it. Read it through and you see him work, 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 work through so many people. So many miraculous and powerful ways. And my purpose for this message this morning is to say, do we expect the same? Do we expect the same now? Or is it just contained here for our reading and that's it? Disciples in Luke 17, verse 5, <coughs> said to Jesus, Lord, increase our faith. That's my prayer for us all this morning. Lord, increase our faith. I don't know, friends, what God's going to do here. I don't know if he's going to use this church to see myriads of people saved. <clears throat> I don't know if he's going to bring revival to ask him. Or surrounding villages or towns. I don't know that. But should we not pray for it? Should we not hope for it? Should we not expect? That over the last 28 years he's kept this church going. And should we not expect for the next 28 years that this building is outgrown? Should we not expect... That we have to find ourselves in a place where we're talking together as a church and saying, what are we going to do? We've got all these people that want to come and sit here. We've got no space for them. It's not enough just to remove the bookcases. We need a bigger building. Oh yeah, it'd be nice, wouldn't it? Well, why not, why not expect it? Why not believe? Why not pray for it? That's what I'm saying. Lord, increase our faith. Let's pray.
Father God, we come to you asking for your help. And I come to you asking for help for me. Forgive me, O oh God, when I've lived. Thinking of the Bible of, as those times. Thinking of uh, Bibles in history as, as years gone by. And things that's happened. With, because they were good men. They were godly men. You used them because of that reason. Lord, oh, forgive me for thinking that somehow you're done in this generation. Perhaps I've not said it. Perhaps I've not even thought I believed it. But have I acted in that way? Do I believe that you've somehow finished miraculously and powerfully moving in this generation? Forgive me if I ever have, Lord God. I pray for us as a church, Lord, that you would inspire us with great expectations. Lord, that we would believe your word that says that you can do abundantly above all that we can ask or think. And may we expect it, may we pray it, may we talk to one another about it, and may we see it by your grace coming to fruition. Lord, may it be that you use us in our daily lives. May it be for those people that you've, you've put on our hearts to pray for. Lord, that you would so do a wonderful work in them. Lord, may it be that we be the mouthpiece for many of our relatives and friends for which they come to faith. Lord, of course, the gospel being the power of God unto salvation, but may we be the mouthpiece for many salvations. And Lord, let's not think small. Help us to begin to think bigger about what you might want to do here. Help us to expect for impossible things, Lord. Help us to plan and to set into motion things that come out of this church that we simply can't afford to do. And let us, Lord God, then see the God of heaven and earth move and do wonders amongst us and provide for everything. And may it be that at the end of it all, that our praise and worship be revolutionised because we've seen the God of heaven and earth move so mightily. Lord, use us, we pray. And I pray this, Lord, increase our faith. Father, I ask that you glorify your name amongst us. In every situation, help us to ask according to your will. And Lord, help us to have faith. Not to wait until we have every piece set in place. But Lord, to move trusting in your provision and in your calling. And Lord, that we might see you move so mightily. Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.